have the green one and the black one. Here you go, sweetie. <laughs> It looks like it's kind of cool. <laughs> funny. Alexis, come hold her so I can take some pictures. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're such a sweet animal. How did you turn out so beautifully? Hi, I'm Dr. Weibel. I'm here with the goat. Welcome. Hi, welcome. Carrots. <laughs> So we're going to read the chapter on gown etiquette. What color hat would you like? That one looks fine. Dr. Pamela Weibel is a family physician born into a family of physicians. Her parents warned her not to pursue medicine, but she followed her heart only to discover to heal her patients she had to first heal the profession. So she quit her job at a large Eugene clinic and led downtown hall meetings where she invited patients to design their own ideal clinic. Open since 2005, Eugene's community clinic has sparked a movement in which patients are designing ideal clinics nationwide. Dr. Weibel is co-author of two award-winning anthologies and the author of the bestseller, Pet Goats and Pap Smears, 101 Medical Adventures to Open Your Heart and Mind, a book that celebrates her patients in Eugene. The book is now taught in colleges and medical schools around the country. Dr. Weibel has been interviewed by CNN, ABC, CBS, and is a frequent guest on NPR. And so please, oh, one more thing. If you can do me a favor, turn off those cell phones. Stow those iPads. This is Angel's tricorders. Put away any intergalactic communication device you're using these days. And please join me in a warm, Gene, welcome for Dr. Pamela Weibel. Welcome to the Eugene Public Library and to the celebration of pet goats and pap smears. So to start with, I just want to ask a question of the audience. And this is going to be interactive, so feel free to blow your party horns and maybe, you know, burst out with some comments that you think might be enlightening for the group. But I would first like to know who believes that we have ideal medical care in the United States? Just raise your hand. No hands. Okay. Who would like to have ideal medical care in the United States? All right. So this is actually the manual for ideal medical care in the United States. I know some people think it might be the 2,800 pages or so of legislation out of DC. And that does help maybe in some areas, but as far as face-to-face -face with your doctor or nurse or your health care provider, the type of care that people in Eugene, maybe somebody could shut the door, that people in Eugene would like to have is outlined in this book. And it seems to be the type of care that people want all over the country. Now, I would like to know who has read this book. Just raise your hand. What do you all think? Well, hilarious. Could not put it down, even though I tried. <laughs> and does anyone, specifically people who've read the book, might be more clued in, does anyone have any idea why there's a goat on the cover of this book? 
I'd like to have, just raise your hand if you have any idea, maybe even an inkling about why there's a goat on the cover. And I'd like to have three of you come up to the front, please. You're, you're going to get awards. Anyone who comes up to the front is going to get a prize. So, yeah, come on up to the front. Three people, you might have to run and compete at times. Okay, what's your name? Jasper, do you want to tell everyone? You can turn around and just talk into this and explain why you think the goat might be on this book cover. Because if there was more health, then more farmers would get to yeah, have more goats. Okay, so she said, if there's more health, then more farmers would get to have more goats. That's a great idea. Tell everyone your name and come up to the front. Uh, my um, name is Arun, and I think the reason there is a goat there is because Pamela is a doctor who does not have a white coat. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a white coat, I have a white goat. <laughs> and maybe that would help. Just that one shift in most clinics might bring us down to earth and uh, maybe we'd have more ideal medical care. Who knows? Kiki, what do you think? <laughs> Kiki illustrated the book. Me to tell, tell tell everyone why you think the goat's on the cover. I'm not telling you. <laughs> okay, I know the reason. Uh, I forget. <laughs> no, I do know the reason. The reason was that when Pamela did this everywhere when she was asking folks um, to come and meet with her in her town hall meetings which is what this is again. Again, does this work better? Yeah. yeah. Dang. Oh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, oftentimes, across the country, wherever it was that she would go, speaking to audiences, somebody invariably would say, we want a pet goat. Can we bring our goats? Will you have a goat? And then, uh, <laughs> Everywhere, a lot of folks always wanted a, a therapy goat or a friend goat there to keep them company while they got a pap smear or whatever else. So <laughs> that's the reason. That's the reason why. What was the one that uh, the uh, Jacob? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Jacob. I'll read it. Yeah, yeah. That part. Okay. okay. Thank you, everybody. And <laughs> you all get prizes at the end. Anyone who comes up at the end of the night. You can pick from a t-shirt, a book, or a button, or anything I have on that table. So. Thank you. so this is the reason why the goat is on the cover of the book, is I had these town hall meetings, and uh, this is the result right here of the town hall meetings throughout Lane County. There's 100 pages of testimony here, and all I did was ask, how can I serve you? What can I do for you? What kind, describe your ideal clinic. And people wrote pages and pages of what they really want. And all I did, it's kind of a no-brainer, is read what they want and do it. So what came as sort of a shock to me is, again, all the times that people would mention goats or use goat metaphors or analogies. And I can, I can read one of them. This is from, let's see. <clears throat> so, by the way, what people mostly want is a happy doctor. People want a happy, uh oh, a happy doctor who is on time and respects the patients in a comfortable room where there's not, you know, a ton of fluorescent lights and scary sharp instruments and cold hands and cold stethoscopes. And they just want basically a human 
being. They want to walk into a place that feels like a living room and sit with somebody who they consider a friend who happens to be their doctor. That's what people want in Eugene and a lot of other towns. And this is, you know, it's not just the goat that was, uh, there's, there's, there's more than the goat theme going on. The people that talked about goats also talked about cats at the same time, and it happened in different cities, and I just had to laugh. But I'm going to read this from Jacob. He's the star of chapter 2 in the book, and this is his testimony. They would have a pet cat that would greet you in the waiting room, house plants, cool kids' toys, good and intriguing magazines that I will ask to borrow and I'll have time to read, a clean space with friendly, relaxed workers that I know, a community of doctors that work in all types of practices and work together to heal people in need, massage, western and eastern, medicine, acupuncture, and whatever else is available from this cohesive community of healers. They would have a big garden and a running stream, and you could come over for lunch and play with the pet goats who would inadvertently heal your broken leg. <laughs> and I'm going to play you another piece of testimony and audio um, from Wisconsin when I did an, a, a town hall meeting there with about 300 people. And you can hear another woman talk about goats. <laughs> My name is Debbie Here we go. Oh, hi, I'm Carrie from Western Dairyland. Um, when my goat was sick, I was able to call the Osceola Augusta Veterinary Clinic. And Dr. Linda showed up at my farm in Augusta, went out into the pasture, put her hip boots on, brought her six year old son with her, and her intern went out into the pasture, listened to us, and followed us. We all chased him down and took care of him in the barn. Then she went on to the nesting box where we had a new litter of kittens and took a look at all of those kittens to make sure that they were okay and gave us what she thought the gender was. And then she went to the house and set up on our porch a triage table for my house cat who was having some issues, all to the cost of a $35 house call. That's what I want. <laughs> That's what, maybe not to be treated like a human, but like a goat. I want to, I was trying to think of a nice snappy title and of course I do a lot of pap smears and I thought what would pair well with a pap smear? Oh, a pet goat, of course. And it, and it was really interesting finding this goat, that's a whole other story that's in the book. So back to the town hall testimony, I just want to say that I collected this 100 pages of testimony and this was nine town hall meetings over a period of six weeks and I read the testimony, I was able to adopt 90% and open this ideal medical clinic one month later. Yeah, with no extra loans or anything, it's just what people want is so simple. And this has now been replicated across the country. Doctors are coming to retreats to learn how to do the same thing in different cities. And patients are taking charge of not only their own health, but the kind of health care they'd like to receive. So why, I'd like to just open up another question for people to win some prizes. Why do you think I did this? Why would I go to the trouble of having town hall meetings and doing this whole weird, wacky thing? Oh, come to the front. Three people come to the front and maybe share. All right. Hi, I'm Jeff. And the uh, reason she did this was she was sick and tired of normal medicine as it has become industrialized and so depersonalized that it was just major burnout. And had this epiphany and thought, just ask people what they want and give it. 
Ta-da! <laughs> yeah, right on target. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, why would somebody do something like this? I think that personally she just cared about people and wanting to get people well. This was a way to do it. Thank you. And what's your name and <laughs> why name, would I do My name's Lon, uh -huh. and uh, I was going to say the same thing James did, but uh, I came up here for a like, prize. <laughs> <laughs> Because she wanted to do something from her heart and not from uh, no time to say, say hello. Here. What are job <laughs> So all of those reasons are correct. Um, I was basically absolutely incredibly out of control, miserable in my last <laughs> several, all my last jobs that I had many jobs as an employed physician and I just became actually super depressed and then became suicidal and didn't really get out of bed for I quit my job and laid down for six weeks in bed and hardly moved because I just couldn't believe that this country was going to make it so difficult for me to be a healer. That's all I ever wanted to be was help people. Why should I have so many obstacles? Why? It just didn't make any sense. I felt like my whole life was stolen from me and I just could barely move. I put myself into like a coma. Um, deep depressed, my sister-in-law at the time told me means you need a deep rest. So that's what I did. I took a deep rest and that's when I woke up with this epiphany, which I feel like was given to me by spirit, God, whomever. It was like a big wake-up call from the universe that you don't have to be a miserable doctor. You can actually get to know your patients again and ask your patients for help, which is kind of a novel idea because most doctors don't ask anyone for help. And so to, to, to be vulnerable enough to tell your patients that you're miserable and you just hate your job as a doctor and want them to redesign an ideal clinic and that you'll work for them is kind of a, I guess, a bold move, but it, but it worked. And I think patients are, are brilliant. I mean, asking the end user what they want is, is a good way to go in any business. So then what I do want to talk about that came to me after I wrote the book. The book was published September 29th, and two days later, we had a physician in Eugene who shot himself in the head on Mount Pisgah. So a physician suicide, which was the third physician suicide in 18 months in Eugene. So on the other end of the spectrum is if we don't start creating ideal medical clinics, and we continue in the direction we're going, we're going to lose our doctors either to retirement, depression, burnout, suicide, something, they'll change careers, they'll go into banking, or who knows. But these are people who are humanitarians who went into medicine with idealistic notions, and they were basically, in my opinion, brutalized in their training and graduated medical school with basically PTSD and dehumanization as part of our training because they think it's important for us to be professionally distant, detached, which after a while is harmful to yourself to be detached from your own emotions and spirit. So, so yes, I had to do something. Uh, by the way, not only did we lose three physicians to suicide in Eugene, and we've lost far ma many more than that, but just in a span of 18 months, that's quite a lot. Uh, also, the two men that I dated in medical school died by suicide. So as physicians, when they graduated medical school, you know, leaving young children behind, and it's just so sad and so unnecessary. And so that's the sense of urgency I have with this message, which is why I want all of you to run out of here with as many books as possible and share them, whether you can afford them or not. Or not. I mean, it's $10 for the book. All the money goes to help other physicians open these clinics around the country and to help medical students and yeah, live their dreams, which is what we want. We want our doctors to live their dreams because that's the kind of health care you want to get from a person who loves their job. So what it felt like to me was that I was stuck on an assembly line. It was like assembly line medicine 
and I felt like a factory farmed physician, which is a chapter in the book that I'm going to read a little bit from. Now, most of the book is very uplifting and, and fun, but and I try to make it entertaining to be educated on some topics that maybe some people are not accustomed to hearing about. So I asked a number of physicians who also escaped assembly line medicine if they could come up with a, I, it was a contest I ran, if they could come up with a name um, for the opposite of ideal medical care. What's the opposite? What did you just run away from? And in chapter 31, I'm just going to read the list because I want you to understand how physicians really feel. And here's the list. Production driven health care, Mick medicine, dock in a box, meat market medicine, drive by office visits, take a number, cattle car clinic, zombie care, medi quickie, revolving door practice, freeze dried med, one size fits none, instamed, here's some meds now get out medicine. Premature consultation, <laughs> treadmill medicine, rat race medicine, boot camp medicine, primarily don't care provider. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor patient unrelationship. Please stand behind our bottom line clinic. Shrink wrapped care. What drives our care with a money sign on the S? We provide, you survive hamster wheel medicine. And this is how doctors really feel when they go to work every day. And I think most of them hate it. So I'm just sharing this so that you can have a level of compassion for our wounded healers that are feeling probably very victimized and trapped. And I know in our healthcare system, I, and, and many of you only go to the doctor infrequently, but we're at the doctor's office every day and it <laughs> kind of sucks for us every day if we have a sucky job. And so, there is an alternative. Um, I would like to, uh, to share another, another idea I had when I was depressed. I thought maybe I would go back to waitressing. I started actually dreaming of going back to my waitressing job while I was uh, working in the clinic. Because I thought at least then I could, I could make people happy. Because it, it seemed it's like impossible to make people happy in a 10-minute office visit if they have 60 minutes of problems, and and doctors are perfectionists working in an imperfect medical system, which is an absolute catastrophe for them, their personalities. It makes you feel like a failure at the end of every day, that you can't ever really solve people's problems. You don't have enough time to do it. So I thought I'd just be a waitress again, and I know that if somebody wanted coffee, I could bring it to them, and it would be warm, and I know I could do the croissant thing, and I could bring them what they need, and I thought I would get a job at the beanery at 24th and Hilliard. And I was really excited to just do a career shift and maybe live in a tent or whatever I had to do so that I could be a human being again and be friendly and make people happy, which is all I wanted to do. And so, uh, before I filled out the application, I got depressed and I, got, I thought, well, maybe they won't accept me because I'm overqualified. And that just <laughs> sent me into another kind of depression. But I would like to ask some people from the audience, well, just raise your hand if you've ever left a really great tip for a waitress. Okay, now why, why would you do that? Why would you leave a great tip? Because they're underpaid. Great service. Great service. Fun. Fun, attentive, friendly. Mm -hmm. Great. Just to be nice. And just to be nice, yeah. So, has anyone left a, a tip for their doctor? Raise your hand. <laughs> Three people have left tips for their doctors. Why? Because I was in France and he liked very much prosciutto hands. And I make prosciutto hands in Parma, so he bought in three uh, big hands. Okay, he was in France and he loves this particular type of ham. He bought three hams for the doctor. Yeah. yeah. He and he, my problems. What? All Italy couldn't resolve my problems and he resolved my problems. He resolved the problem and nobody else could before that. 
So, yes, why? You why? get a second prize. You're going to come to the front. <laughs> <laughs> why did you leave a tip? Well, uh, and what kind of tip did you I leave? I had a piece of stick caught in my eye, stuck in my eye from working on it with a chainsaw. And I went to a doctor over in Coquille, Oregon, and he knew I couldn't afford it. He knew I didn't have the insurance. He only charged me $25. Oh. So I left the tip. That guy sent him an extra 25 but. Oh, nice. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, we're from California, and we have a wonderful family doctor down there, Dr. Vincent. He's French. So we, he would always spend a minimum of 30 minutes with us. And he's part of an HMO, and we always worried he would get in trouble for spending so much time with us. But um, he would tell us uh, about some of his training, and I, when I fly down to California, I, I see him. Um, and even though Pam's my doctor here now, <laughs> um, last time I saw him, I gave him a gift. I gave him Pam's book. <laughs> And I had told him about her, and I had told him what we were doing with charity, and he and he listened, and he was really intrigued, and so I brought my book, and he was really grateful. <laughs> That's a great tip. <laughs> Share this book with your doctor. Here. I'm sorry, I just wondered if you're aware of that. Oh, I know. It's okay. It's all right. I love the way goats and farm animals smell and the whole thing. I was raised in a barn. <laughs> so, so now what's interesting, I never received a tip in my entire life as a doctor until I opened an ideal medical clinic. And then I received a tip from somebody who I won't name, but he's here. And so, <laughs> the guy laughing. <laughs> all right, all right. Do you want to tell the story? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the cat is out of the proverbial bag. But then why would anybody put a cat in a bag? Maybe. Aside from that, um, late one night, my wife, Laura, was having um, uh, pneumonia. And she'd been uh, meeting with Pamela and getting all the right meds and so forth. But she woke up at uh, nearly midnight just coughing, just I almost sounded like her, her head was going to explode. My heart just went out to her just so deeply. And so we uh, called Pamela on her cell phone late, late at night, and she answered. And uh, So in that, I was on uh, being asthmatic, had a certain medication. And she said, oh, well, just have Laura take a couple puffs of that. And so that got Laura through the night. And I thought, gosh, if we, if I had to take Laura down to the emergency room or urgent care, I would have just chewed their heads off. I could have gone physically violent, and I don't like that. <laughs> and so, but here Pamela was right there. I mean, what other doctor would know what meds I was on, what kind of stuff that Laura was dealing with, and at the same time, put them together for this one shot deal? It was brilliant. And so, uh, of course, it was deserving of a tip. <laughs> Thank you. They sent me a $50 check and a holiday card, which I've never cashed because my dad told me to save it and show it when I go on Oprah one day. So <laughs> it's in my special box of souvenirs to show on TV. <laughs> um, and, and so this chapter is in the book. I forget which one, do you know? It's like chapter 11 or something like that, beginning. So yes, I get tips and I think it's because it's a, uh, I did the same actual sorts of treatments of patients before, but I could never be so attentive and um, aware and friendly and happy. I think people are paying for you just being human, I think, uh, which is kind of hard to do in some other situations. So now, you know, I do house calls. I go and see people wherever they are. Sometimes, you know, they're at the... They're at the grocery store. A guy, uh, these, are, these are chapters in the book, a grocery store. I was just looking for pasta sauce one night at Sundance at 11 o'clock. I try to go late at night because I hate shopping. I like to go in the last five minutes that the store's open and run out. And so I was quickly picking out my pasta sauce when a patient of mine walked by and said he thought he had cancer. And he was very upset. 
So I asked more about it, and it was a little spot on his hand. He put his hand right in front of the pasta sauce as I was trying to choose between two different brands. And I could basically tell him within five seconds that it wasn't cancer. So he was super excited, and it didn't slow me down at all. I just still grabbed the pasta sauce and left with my little cart. And then he kept chasing me around the store wanting to give me $10. <laughs> um, but it was really not necessary because it really didn't take any time. And so that's just kind of one common sense ideal medical care solution to a problem because otherwise here's this man who has no insurance and lives in the woods and you know off the grid and he I guess maybe think about calling a dermatologist and have to wait four weeks for the appointment and then he'd get in and get a $400 bill for you know five minute appointment and so and then he'd have all that anxiety while he was waiting the whole month thinking he's gonna die and I solved it just standing in front of the pasta sauce you know, I think most of our problems can be solved standing in the grocery store, but uh, we make things, we make life what, much more complicated than it needs to be. Another time I was at the YMCA watching my nephew's basketball game, and he's this amazing basketball player, and I'm just crazy about him, and he was, you know, making all these dunks, I didn't want to miss anything, so when a patient called to tell me her son had horrible poison oak, I definitely didn't want to leave the basketball game, so I just said, come to the basketball game, I'm at the Y. And so she brought her son there and I was able to examine him while watching my beautiful nephew play basketball and I didn't miss any part of the game and I diagnosed him and treated him for his horrible poison oak and got him his medication called in. So that was another common sense solution. And then I, another time I was going to the DMV when a patient called with a finger injury and I could tell he didn't need stitches, he just needed me to look at it. So I realized, you know, I'm going down West 11th to the DMV and he lives down here by the DMV. I could just tell him to meet me at the DMV, which is what I did instead of driving all the way to my office. And so turns out he actually needed to transfer a car title. So he was thrilled because he'd been, <laughs> he'd been putting that off because it's such a pain to go to the DMV. But now that we sat there together with the same number and I examined his finger in the DMV waiting room and he didn't have insurance, he paid me 50 bucks and I my license renewal was 40 so I earned $10 profit just sitting in the DMV. And he got his car title transferred and I got my license renewed. <laughs> Another thing that makes people really happy is if you're on time and you don't make them wait forever in a big waiting room. And so I'm just curious, you know, in my office people really don't have to wait and if they do have to wait they get a consolation prize which I'll talk about. But has anyone in here had to wait a really long time for a doctor's visit? Just raise your hand. Keep your hand up if it's been more than an hour that you've ever waited. Okay, has it been more than two hours that you've ever waited? More than three hours. I think I see a winner back there. He's very, I'm going to find it. Okay, how many people have waited more than three hours? Keep your hands up. There's four people. Okay, what, how long did you have to wait? About three and a half hours. Would you like to, what was the situation? <laughs> well, you weren't delivering a baby. It wasn't no PGYN. No, no, no. <laughs> I, was a, I was a resident. At uh, UT Southwestern in Texas, I had some problem with my foot, so I made an appointment with an orthopedic surgeon, which is just next door, and I waited three and a half hours. And you were one of the guys. Wow. He was a resident working in the place. Yeah. We treat our own this way. <laughs> <laughs> mm, thank you. I waited all day oh. in the building that was being renovated. Come on. <laughs> Anyone who's got a good waiting room story, come on. I discovered a malignant melodrama growing on my cervix, so I had a radical hippieectomy. And then it was suggested that I go seek potential radiation, but they sent me up to Pill Hill in Portland. And I ended up going alone in my clunker Volvo that barely thought it could make its way up to Portland. And it was raining and pouring, and I finally managed through all these road constructions, etc. I managed to finally get there, and I'm there alone. And the hospital was now amazed with all sorts of curtains hanging and, and construction all over the place. So I finally, finally found the place to be for radiation, to, to consult with them. And I think I started out like at 8.50 something in the morning. 
and by like five in the evening, after I met with, finally found somebody, and they said to me, what? There's no reason for you to be here at all. No, radiation isn't suggested for that. No, you're done, you had surgery, that's it. <laughs> and then I also got lost, both coming and going, et cetera. So I really get a good prize. Yeah, so how long was that of a wait? That was a long wait. Yeah, it was like all day long. All day. And wow. then two years later, it had reoccurred. Less of it and lower down. Oh, and it's extremely rare. Like, she was one of twelve. Yes. One of twelve reported cases in the world. She's the illustrator of the book. Her stories but in the all back of the book. Cases were, the other cases that weren't were reported were in the millions. Wow. <laughs> 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 um, but two years later, I did have radiation, which literally rendered me. So now I always have to be really careful, and I can't ride bikes and whatnot. And there's all these things I can't do anymore. However, I'm here, and I'm alive. So. And I had triplets in 85. Oh. Yeah. Nobody took it. I know. Well, I can't top that. Yes, 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 come up. Yes, you can. Just say your story. All right. This is Lonnie. You might know him from the book. <laughs> I, I was about 16 years old, and I was living in Sacramento, and I got bit uh, on the wrist by a spider. And I went to a, a hospital that I won't mention Kaiser. And uh, <laughs> they had me in there for about three and a half hours, four hours in the emergency ward. They looked me over. They said, ah, it's no problem. It's no problem. By then, the lump had gotten, because whatever it was, my system was biting it off. The lump had gotten to here. And they just, oh, they just missed me. Oh, you'll be all right, kid. Go home. About an hour later, my mother gets a call from the uh, hospital saying, you got to get your son down here right now. He's going to die if you don't get him down here. So by then, the lump was all the way up in the hair. I mean, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. The poison was moving. And they put me in a room. Oh, well, the doctor will be with you right away. Four and a half, almost five hours later, I had the custodian waking me up, saying, why are you in here? I said, ah, I just got up. Like I said, dumb 16-year-old kid. I just got up and walked home and just gave up on the corporate medicine at that point. But yeah. all right. Thank you. You get a t-shirt or a book. You already have a book. So now what happens in the book, you will realize that you do not have to put up with this waiting because actually I learned from a friend of mine who now bills her doctor when the doctor keeps her waiting. She bills the doctor at her hourly rate. So, and she gets reimbursed. So, yeah. So that's a story in the book, how you do that if you're interested. But I think that if we continue to be willing to be disrespected, then we will continue to be disrespected. If everyone stood up tomorrow and demanded to be seen around their appointment time, unless there's a legitimate emergency, then I think we'd have health care reform right away. And what I do is, if for some reason I keep people waiting more than 10 minutes, they get a gift from a gift basket. So I have a nice gift basket full of locally made soaps and lotions and things from Saturday Market. So, so that was fun to do, and people love that. And I think I'll share just a few of my favorite prescriptions from the book. I don't know, who in here feels like we're over-medicated in this country? <laughs> Okay, well, the reason why I think these fast visits, the only way to get out in and out of them is just to write a prescription really fast and pat somebody on the back often. And so now that I have the luxury of some time with my patients, I've been able to really solve their problems and by, by writing prescriptions that really get to the root of their issues. So this is chapter 13, and just I'll read through a little bit of it. Patients expect prescriptions. A lot of patients would be disappointed if they didn't get a prescription, especially I found out like uh, Latin American patients. So there's many minority groups that would feel like they didn't get a fair, a fair visit if they didn't get a pill because that's, of course, why they're there. And so doctors try to deliver. And the problem is that most patients' needs can't be, uh, can't be solved with a little pink pill. So during the past 20 years, I've written a lot of prescriptions. And here are some of my favorites. And I'm going to hand out some prescriptions if you need them. So one is have great sex three times a week. Take a vacation to the coast. 
Go on a seven day silent retreat in the woods. Find a girlfriend. Does anyone need a girlfriend? I have written a prescription here to hand out. If anyone needs a girlfriend, come on up. A boyfriend. A boyfriend. Yes. Here. I'll have to cross out the girl part of this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Refills. My patient took that prescription to Walmart and had a really interesting experience <laughs> when he handed that to the pharmacist. <laughs> That's also a story in the book. <laughs> so, um, what about quit your job? That's a good one. Have your husband do the dishes for a week. Stop worrying, fall in love with yourself, speak your truth, get a puppy. I have a few others I'll pass out here that I think are really good. Like, who wants to have your children massage your feet before bed? Does anyone need that? Okay. And I have another one. Avoid your mother-in-law. Who needs that one? Does anyone need that one? Avoid your mother-in-law? Okay, well, that's popular among some people. <laughs> now, I would just want to tell a few, a few recent, a recent story that kind of blew my mind as I saw, uh, these are just three stories, uh, three or four stories on patients who really didn't need a pill, and if you gave them a pill, they'd probably be worse off. This one woman came to see me just a few weeks ago, and she was covered in pain patches. She sees another doctor, chronic pain issues. I just, she's like close to 80. I was just examining her, and even just touching her lightly on the skin, she was jumping off the table and was in just excruciating pain. And it was very concerning. I spent an hour trying to figure this out with her, and I determined that a lot of her pain was probably emotional, that her pain was actually not physically based. I discussed that with her. She seemed to have a revelation. I didn't specifically tell her to do anything about this, but she went home and got off her pain patches and called me a week later to tell me that she has no pain. So I think this is happening around the country where people are being dosed with a lot of drugs for physical ailments that are not physical necessarily in nature, or at least they could be dealt with in a different way. And um, another patient that I saw, this is a story in the book called Speak Your Truth. This was a 16-year-old teenager who came in and she had burning with urination and frequency with, uh, you know, frequency of urination. And usually in a fast-paced clinic, you would just go get the urine t a test and, you know, speed her along and consider it a urine infection probably. But I was just listening to her story and she was only getting these symptoms at home and I realized that her home life was a little bit chaotic with a new live-in uh, girlfriend of her father's. And so I just told her what she really needs to do is let her father know how pissed off she is with him. And she needs to speak her truth and not hold it in. Because that was, you know, so she did. She did that. I never even examined her. I didn't touch her. I didn't look at her urine. I didn't do anything with her. And she called me up after talking to her father and told me her, her, her problems were gone. She had no more urinary symptoms. Another woman came in and she had foot pain. Her foot was in my face. I was trying to examine it. She was limping around. We ended up having a really great visit. For some reason, we just were laughing the whole time. And even though her naked foot was in my face, I forgot to examine her foot. So it was kind of odd, because later on, I went to write her chart note, and I never touched her foot. And then I felt bad, like an idiot. And I called her up to offer a free appointment. And she told me her pain disappeared as soon as she left the room. <laughs> so all right. That's interesting, and I bet that could happen more more frequently than it than it does. And uh, one other recent case, um, a man came in with erectile dysfunction, and and so he tried all these different pills, and nothing worked. And turns out that he broke up with his girlfriend, has a new girlfriend, everything's fine. So, so I realized that there is no pill that can reverse the damaging effects of being in the relationship with the wrong man or woman. There's no pill that can reverse that. So there's some things in life that need different prescriptions. 
And I think with electronic medical records, because I still handwrite prescriptions, I think there's no real box to check for the things that people really need. You just give them drugs easily and electronically and pretty fast. And so that's why I like to handwrite my prescriptions, because I like to give people what they really need, which is, again, often not a drug. So who believes healthcare should be fun? <laughs> Raise your hand. OK. Who does not have insurance? and is looking for a doctor. Anyone without insurance looking for a doctor? Okay, anyone else? Who, who is looking for a doctor and has insurance? Raise your hand. If you, if you would like to have fun at a doctor's office, yes, okay, come to the front if you want to have a fun office visit. If you want to have a fun office visit, come to the front. Okay, only three people, but however. Oh, you want to do it? Okay, okay. You'll be the runner-up. Hold on. We'll have to see whether they're into this because we have, I'm going to offer you all a free office visit with me if you want, but see, you, you can't just get it just for walking up here. you got to do something. you got to, um, where is it? Where's my hula hoops? <laughs> we're going to do, we're going to do hula hooping for health care. So, everyone, Take a hula hoop who wants to participate. And I'm going to stand over here, and you can go next. Maybe we'll have to do two sets of people. We'll do this twice, OK? Now, whoever can hula hoop the longest wins a, a free physical. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> But just a minute first, the next group will do, you want to try? Okay, see how long you do it. I wonder if you do it long. That's amazing. <laughs> and she's hardly moving. And how, that's incredible. What's this? A pat party? Does anyone know what a pat party is? Three people who, who would be interested in a pat party should come to the front. <laughs> That's incredible. Is there anyone interested in a pat part? That's amazing. Wow. I'm so impressed. Okay. I don't think I have the right part. Okay, well, that's all right. You can come. Okay. Anyone else interested in a pat party? Okay, come on up. So we're going to do this again. After she gets tired, <laughs> we're going to see who can hula hoop the longest and you'll win a pat party. And if it's you, I'll get really creative and I'll try to figure out, but hold on. Yeah, prostate exam parties, that's the next thing on the list. <laughs> okay, so here you go. That's incredible. And you can win anything from that table. Take two things off the table. <laughs> All right, ready? We're going to do one, two, three, just a minute. One, two, three, go. You won. Yours hit the floor, the right cheek. All right. So, a free pat party. Here you go. Let me know whenever you want to come. <laughs> so before I end the, you know,
speaking part of this. We'll all do Q&A. And I wanted to know if there's any people from the book that want to make a statement about, about their feelings regarding ideal medical care. I mean, the whole reason I'm doing this isn't just, you know, for fun and games, although that's fun, but I would like to just demonstrate that these are the types of stories that really heal people. That people come to the doctor and they're healed by laughter sometimes, more than, more than um, a narcotic and more than a physical therapy prescription. So, you know, we really need such simple things from one another. And if you are in the book and you would like to share anything, now would be a great time if you want. And no pressure. Otherwise, we'll just have Q&A. Do you want to come up? Okay. First of all, thank you for being you. Seriously. I moved here from San Francisco about five, well, it's actually seven years ago now. It's been a long time. But uh, fortunately, I was steered in her direction a while back. And the first thing she told me was, if you saw it on TV, don't ask me about it. Because I don't believe in 98% of the stuff that they're trying to ram down your throat on TV. So that's, that was the first thing that made me know that I was in the right direction. <laughs> Which I don't even remember saying that. Well, there you go. <laughs> you Thank you. So Q&A, anyone that has a question about anything having to do with medical, come on up to the front if you don't mind, or I could repeat it, whatever. Just how you balance the need to make a living wage with not rushing people, with not being late for appointments. Good question. Okay, so how do I balance making a living wage with not rushing people? So a lot of times, and not, and, and not, and not uh, being late. And not being late for appointments. Right. So a lot of times people have the notion that I must be just kind of hanging out, making minimum wage as a doctor, just running around with goats. And actually, <laughs> actually, I, I'm not motivated by money, honestly, so that's not a big motivator for me. But I do have to say, I, in my first year of practicing this way, could make just the same money as my full-time employee job in the big clinic in town working part-time in this manner. And the reason why is that when you lower your overhead, my favorite factory job, my overhead was 74%, and now my overhead is close to 10%. So what that means, if you were to come in with pneumonia and give me 100 bucks, there's a big difference between my take-home of 26 at the other place and now basically 90, right? So you keep a lot more of the money you earn when you take out all the no value added intermediaries that have inserted themselves so forcefully in between the doctor and the patient as kind of like parasites sometimes. And so basically then it becomes a sustainable practice because you can move slower and see people more efficiently and actually solve their problems and earn a better income. So, any other questions? Yes? I need your opinion. Um, I work with seniors, and they become your family, and um, I will sometimes call them sweetie, because they are. And in the professional world, if you call someone sweetie or honey, it's disrespect. But when you have a close relationship in medicine, they are part of your family that you care about. Is that wrong? So she, she works with seniors and she calls them sweetie and honey and that's like a term of, infect, of, of affection, not infection, but she's being affectionate with her clients. And is it wrong to do that? And it is not wrong to do that. I believe in professional closeness and not professional distance because I think professional distance is harmful to us as healers because we're turning a portion of ourselves off and not connecting. And so the idea that you could connect as a real human being and with respect call the other person honey or you know, whatever it is, that's totally, you know, there are people who do that in a disrespectful way, but if you're doing it from the right place, that's totally fine. And I think some of this, why it's so confusing for people, this professional closeness notion, is that we have inherited a patriarchal healthcare model, which values 
uh, male traits and male ways of thinking, which tend to be, and sorry if I'm generalizing here, but tend to be volume, speed, money, pr proof, graphs, charts, you know, just to, um, you know, that sort of manner of thinking, whereas female values of love and nurturing and caring and compassion are not considered um, you know, something to remunerate, you know, it's not, they're not valued. And so all I'm really doing, I've finally figured out, is just not being, a, I'm not afraid to be a real woman doctor, okay? I'm not trying to be a masculinized version of a woman doctor, which a lot of women do, to compete in a male type of healthcare model. You know, so they talk tough and they have their graphs and their charts and they're, you know, ready to prove things. And so I'm just being a woman. And it's totally fine to be yourself and be a doctor, a nurse, or any other profession, as long as you're coming from a place of respect. So, not wrong. Any other questions about anything? Well, what kind of support staff do you have? What kind of support staff do I have? I have no support staff. You guys are my support staff. I feel so supported by my community. So, that really helps. That helps because people come and they're prepared for their appointments and they're ready with their co-pays and they're not, they know that if they're not prepared for their appointment, they're gonna get less out of their appointment and they're gonna throw extra work my way and then I'll burn out and I'll be where I was before. So it's a group effort, like if patients come and they are prepared and ready and, and have their questions listed and all of that, it works wonderful. I build the insurance companies myself I do my own, I take out my own trash, I, you know, do my own laundry uh, for the gowns and all of that, and so I take the vital signs of my patients like a nurse would do while I'm talking to them, so I do all the, all the tasks and I don't feel burdened by it because I work at a very humane pace. Now, what technology has allowed some people to do is be enslaved to an inhumane pace. And my understanding of technology and its promises was that it was going to make our life easier and not harder. And so I think we need to be in control of what we're doing with technology and not letting technology control us and, making, and decreasing the quality of our life, which I think has happened in medicine. You know, it's kind of the difference between, you know, being a parent of two children, you could probably do that really well, but parenting 17 children, you might not do so well. And that's what some doctors are doing, is they have caseloads of people, like 2,000 patients they're responsible for. There's no way you can take care of 2,000 people well in 10 minute office visits. It just isn't gonna happen, so. Also, on, on your, you can take your laptop with you wherever you go with, uh, on through the exam, you just step in your notes right there and you don't have any records keepers. Right, yeah, so I just, and I type with two fingers. I type this whole book with two fingers, which I think that's worth getting a copy just to say that I did that. Um, it's, uh, and I move kind of fast now. I should have taken typing a long time ago. It would have helped me. But uh, yeah, I enter my own chart notes and yeah. So. Do you ever refer patients to specialists? Like, do you have a network of doctors? Yes, I refer patients to all the same specialists that I would if I was in any other group in town. So I kind of know some of the really good cardiologists. I still refer to some of the really good cardiologists, and I, you know, know the neuro, you know, the neurologists who tend. I, I know what my patients want is people who spend more time with them. So I know which doctors are more kind of like me, so that they're not just getting rushed through. And then I, yeah send the chart notes to the other doctors and have the same kind of relationship I would have with them anywhere else. Except, what's interesting is now that I spend so much time with my patients, I really fill out a very complete chart note on them, including their social history. And there's a woman that I see who uh, was writing a children's book. I think, uh, what was the name of the lead character? Zulu or something, or uh, Zola. I forget the name. There's a children's book that one of my clients is writing and I had interviewed her about it and written that in her chart note and so when she went to the cardiologist the first thing he said is how's your book coming along <laughs> so I think the fact that I can humanize my patients even on their chart notes kind of jolts the 
the specialist to see them as, oh, a real person with a real life who does other things other than come to the neurologist. Okay. <laughs> yes? Uh, as a prospective new uh, client, can you describe what the first appointment was like and what are your office hours? Okay. As a prospective new client, okay, my office hours are, I usually do like two to three half days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, afternoons and evenings, but I see patients any other time on the other days if they have an urgent matter. But most of the time we can handle everything during the scheduled office visit. And the first visit is an hour and we try to go through everything that's happened to you that's relevant to that visit and get a good overview and try to deal with whatever issues you have at hand. And so you'd be sitting in a living room setting on a cute little futon and I'm gonna be in a little wicker chair with my laptop and smiling at you and I'll be sitting kind of close to you. And hopefully it won't be too close, but if, it, if you look like you're nervous, I'll back up. But um, <laughs> I'm kind of one of those people that gets close. <laughs> and so uh, if you wanna wear a party hat, that's fine. If you wanna bring your goat, that's fine. <laughs> I'm just open to whatever will be healing for you. I don't claim to know what will heal you. You know, that's something we figure out together, and you probably know more about your body than I do since you've been living in it, you know? So that's why it's a partnership effort, and if you feel good, I have patients who bring their pets to their appointments. If that makes them feel more comfortable, I am going to welcome their pets to the appointment. So, any other? Do you have an office or do you work out of your home? Do I have an office or do I work out of my home? I work out of a wellness center, Tamarack Building in South Eugene, where my office has been for the last eight years. And so it's a wellness center in that it has other practitioners like massage therapists and a pool and, and uh, acupuncture and different things so people can go use other healing arts services. There's a yoga studio there. And I just rent this 280 square foot office that that's what the patients told me they wanted is a small cozy space. I think when people are sick they want to feel like they're in their bedroom with their mom or something. And so I think that's what I'm recreating is kind of that womb-like bedroom experience with somebody who's maternal. So that's the scene in my office. Well how does the uh, medical community treat you, or regard you? Uh, are they sort of mm -hmm. frightened, concerned? How does the medical community treat me? Are they frightened or, or concerned? Um, well, I have to say that my my father, what? Well, I have to go to urgent care because Pamela was out of town last oh. week. Um, wait, 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 start over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I have to go to urgent care because I had an infected tattoo and Pamela just happened to be getting on a plane, plane to go somewhere. So she said, you have to go to urgent care. And, um, I actually had a pretty great experience at urgent care, but the doctor, who was really nice, was like, oh, Miss Weibel's your doctor, and he thought very highly of her, and he was just an urgent care doctor. So, um, I just wanted to put my two so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think that other doctors, when there's a doctor that does something a little different, um, that I think what happens is other doctors are kind of like spying on you to see like, okay, like, is that going to work? You know what I mean? So my sense, what I feel like is they're kind of like peeking out through their little um, mini blinds, you know, just a little bit, just to kind of see what in the world is going on out there. And they're kind of secretly rooting for you because they're like, I'm kind of screwed up and I need help and I hope it works what you're doing so I can follow you. So that's the sense that I get from other doctors. And over the last four years, uh, over the last eight years since I've done this, my dad, who's a physician, retired, he's 90 years old, he thinks I've been getting hate mail the whole time. But, you know, I guess that's how he sees the world, like as a scary place maybe, where doing something out of the ordinary could be unsafe in his, you know, it's your own lenses you're looking through. But to tell you the truth, I've only had four hate mail letters, and two of them were from doctors, and they were about the billing your doctor for making you wait thing. And one woman was just like, in a, one, one woman, she's like from the East Coast, and she's like, great, just throw me under the bus. You know, because she's, she's like, 
like my life already sucks and now I'm going to get billed. And it's like, okay, well, this could be a wake-up call. Like, I'm trying to trying to get like patients and physicians like on the same level here. So that means each side has to move kind of closer to each other. And so you might have to just, anyway, it didn't really work to talk to her because she, some people like to live in victim mode. Okay, they, you cannot convince them that, it, that they should change. So that's okay. The other guy sent me an email where he called me some sort of egomaniac. He went on and on and on. And then the next day, he wrote me back and said, I'm so sorry I sent that to you. <laughs> so he apologized in less than 24 hours. So I don't really call that hate mail. That sort of canceled that one out. <laughs> so really, in eight years, I only got one piece of hate mail from a doctor. I got two pieces of hate mail from some other people, not doctors. That's OK. I can take it. <laughs> and not having to do with medicine. <laughs> I'll just tell you to be you know, just to be honest, it is I received some angry letters from the wives of physicians who've recently committed suicide. Okay? Because you know, to talk there's no convenient time to talk about suicide. Whenever you bring it up, there will be somebody who recently committed suicide and their family will still be grieving. So the problem is that if we keep sweeping it under the carpet and never talk about it as a trend and as a real, you know, like we have the highest suicide rate of any profession. Physicians, there's no convenient time to talk about that. So uh, apparently I brought it up at a time when wounds were still raw for two women. Um, although the other surviving spouses who had spouses that died years before were very thankful about what I was doing. So I just consider it wounds still raw. I'm not taking it personally. So any other questions? What's your opinion on Obamacare? My opinion on Obamacare. Well, Obamacare is not really health care reform, it's health health insurance reform. So what he's trying to do is control for-profit insurance companies so they behave a little better and maybe cover a little more. And But it doesn't really get into what actually happens between you and your doctor and your office as far as how they relate to you and whether they're on time and all these other things that people really, what people write about in the town hall testimony is kind of seems like completely unrelated to health insurance reform. So in, in many in many ways. So uh, what I think about it is, let's see, for-profit health insurance stocks have gone up, which you know I guess they're really happy about Obamacare. What's really interesting is that okay, I recently, by the way, my mom has all her investments in healthcare. My mom is a psychiatrist. She was put out of business by like HMOs. I don't even. I think she left. She got bored. But anyway, she's been to so many of my events. But she, she basically got put out of business by for-profit health insurance. She, took, she, she, she quit her psychiatric practice, then took all her money and invested in the people who put her out of business since they were doing so well and she wasn't. And so she's made a lot of money that way. That's how she funded my college and part of my medical school is through for-profit insurance. Now, it is a conundrum because I got a phone call the other week from a for-profit health insurer who wanted to negotiate a price and get me in network on this certain patient. And I thought, you know, luckily they got me on the phone uh, for them because, you know, I wouldn't necessarily return their call because I'm not interested in getting into conversations about whether I want to be in, in network or not. But this guy basically, I said, well, since you got me on the phone, what are you suggesting? And he said, well, on patients such and such, for data service such and such, you billed us $135, and we'd like to offer you $41. <laughs> And I said, wow, that's worse than, that's like less than what a plumber makes. <laughs> so I told him, no, thank you, hung up the phone. And then I called my mom and I was like, and I put it on Facebook, you know, oh, I never guessed, got this phone call. And then I told my mom, you know, what happened. And, and uh, she goes, you didn't accept the 41? And I said, no. She said, you're cutting into my retirement. <laughs> interesting world we live in, you know, where you have to join the other side to survive, I guess. I try not to. But down the road, do we even need insurance? 
down the road do we even need insurance? And wouldn't it be better to have doctor patient? Yeah, I think for primary care, the analogy that's really good, back to the restaurant scene, is if you build a third party for your primary care, like what I do is kind of basic stuff, like it's not lung transplants that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, this, if you build a third party for your restaurant, you know, you would basically wait like, two weeks for a table and have 10 minutes to eat and it would cost twice as much, something like that. So it's like, and it doesn't really make sense that we're inviting insurance into such simple relationships that are really basically affordable for most people and the ones that aren't, we can do sliding scale or something. I mean, obviously if you need a lung transplant, you need a team and a tertiary care center and somehow to pay for that, you know, but 99% of what 99% of people need most of the time could be delivered in their neighborhood by a friendly doctor with a goat. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Where did you, where did you get the goat? Tell where did I get the goat? My mom invited, okay, I was looking for a goat. I needed a celebrity goat that would be on the front of a book. But I asked all my friends, do you know of a celebrity goat in town? And they said, well, my neighbor has goats, but they just, they don't seem like celebrities. They just eat grass and roam around in the field. And so I just thought maybe God or spirit would bring me a goat. And I was really praying. And my mom invited me around that time to a soap making class. And I told her, I'm writing a book, and I'm editing a manuscript, and I'm really not in the soap-making phase of my life right now. <laughs> but she was very persistent because she wanted to spend time with me. So, and she said she already paid for the class. So she guilt-tripped me into it, and I went. I t when I got there, I put in my earplugs, which I keep in my bra, and I, uh-oh, she's peeing. Oh no, I'm gonna move this way. She's such a sweet animal. She's really held her bladder for a long time. But um, it's okay, it's okay, sweetie. So what happened is that I was at the soap making class and, and all of a sudden they started, I had my earplugs and I told my mom, look, I'm not gonna pay attention to the soap making because I'm going to be editing my book. So I had my Pet Goats and Pap Smears manuscript. But then what happened, wow, that is so cool. What happened is that, what happened is that all these people started talking about goat milk soap. So I took my earplugs out and I wanted to try to just hear, whenever anyone mentioned goat, I was just paying really close attention. And then Aida, the woman in the, red hat there, raised her hand and said, hey, I just moved here from California with a mobile petting zoo with uh, 15 goats or something like that. And I thought that was my cue because I was reading in the book a whole section about maybe I'll have pap smears in a petting zoo. I, and I, I was something about a petting zoo when, right when she raised her hand and said she's here with a petting zoo. And so I thought that was the message, right? That was the, she was sent to me from the universe. I went to her on the break and I said, uh, do you, you have the goats? And she said, yeah. I said, I'm writing a book about pet goats. And Pastor, she was so excited. Because I said, I need, uh, she, I said, what kind of goats do you have? And she said, therapy goats. They help people heal. That's exactly what I was looking for. Amazing, right? Any other questions? Uh. Did you ever consider the creating your own type of uh, insurance that people pay them per month when they are not sick? So Did I ever think of creating my own insurance where people pay when they're well and then when they're sick they don't pay? That's not only the question. All the people that cannot pay can get yeah, subscriptions. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that other right. So that the people who can pay support the people who can't pay. Um, I, I don't have anything like that set up, but people have suggested things along that line. Arun has suggested that in the past. And so um, I, I still don't turn anyone away for lack of money. So I see anyone who wants to come to me. But no, I don't have any, I don't have that thought about many different things. But I'm just doing what's simplest for me is just fee for service. When people come, they pay for what they get. And, the people who have money, the haves support the have-nots in every, it's like a microcosm of the world where the haves are supporting the have-nots. Anything else? No.
what are your thoughts about uh, right now, well, uh, changing the way we recruit so-called medical students and training them to be doctors? I mean, there's something that has to be changed at that level. Um, the way we train people to become doctors, and I'm sure you experience some pretty, like you say, PTSD when you get out of that thing, and yet you, 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 you've completely lost connection with your heart. The very thing that drives you to, to become a doctor, and after you finish with that process, I don't know what you become, but uh, probably yeah. <laughs> a little bit different from what you had thought you become. What are your thoughts about retraining, mean, how we need to change that, the way we educate people to become doctors? So the question is, and that's the last question, and then we'll have time to hang out, and if you want me to sign books, I can. But how can we change the medical education system and the way we recruit doctors so that they actually can graduate humanized instead of with PTSD? And how we do that is by valuing other skills and traits besides their test scores. I mean, right now it's all about test scores and competitive extracurricular activities and all of this. A woman recently came to my retreat. She told me that the pre-med advisor suggested that she go into um, uh, social work instead of medicine and she's like a totally heart-centered beautiful person but she didn't have her bulked up extracurricular activities and she, that she was uh, asked why why didn't she volunteer at the hospital and do all these different things she said I'm taking care of my ill mother and my friend who was suicidal and the pre-med advisor told her stop doing that they're draining you you know what I mean just you have to be competitive stop taking care of your own family members who are ill and yeah, yeah, and she, if you want to be a doctor, you need to stop caring about all these things and get competitive and cutthroat, right? And then, um, I, I, don't, I won't even share some other disturbing stuff that happened, but we need to change. I think the answer to your question is we need to reach into our souls and find ourselves again, and we need to have connected, heart-centered, warm, like real people as doctors, and then we will value training the next generation the same way. I think the book shows that it's possible to be a, a complete human being and a doctor and not like remove any part of yourself or disassociate from your emotions and spirit. So thank you all for coming. This is the type of health care that people should be getting around the country. I would encourage you. The books are ten dollars each. They go, you know, the proceeds go to charity to help more clinics like this open around the country. And I would love for you to share these with as many people as possible. So, and I'll sign your books. And there's T-shirts. Look, a one of a kind situation here. This one. To uh, Peter or to the uh, to, uh, Oh, you've already signed it. Yeah, oh, okay. I signed and kiss every I didn't book. know. I thought you did it as this is yeah. great. I didn't know it was oh, you already thought I said it. I really I was <laughs> kissed. No, anyway. Thanks right. a lot.